Live from New York, it is Saturday in downtown New York City. I am at the Grand Hyatt, and this is the most unbelievable podcast I've ever done. This is, I've done, um, I'm coming up on about 100, and you are the most, th- this would be like Jimmy Kimmel getting Obama or Madonna to come on his show at the same night. Um, you are absolutely a legend of dentistry to everyone I know. Um, I got a school in 87, and I got this crazy idea that I was going to, get my FAGD and I stumbled upon your course and um, I was literally taking it for the requirements and I was looking at the AGD deal and you just you just blew my mind away the only thing I can remember at the end of that class is I I went into paranoia hyperdrive I bumped up my CE um, diet to about 300 to 500 hours a year because after listening to you for one day it was so amazing and I, I was sitting there realizing like dude you don't even know what you don't know and I could have listened to you for 40 days and 40 nights, and everyone I've ever met that's gone to your Koi Center, their dentistry went to a different level. So thank you for that. Thank you, Howard. And thank you for now your time. So my, my first question Actually, to you, Howard, I will tell you, I, what you're talking about, I remember vividly in some respects because I did a lecture one in the mid-'90s at the AACD, and the only reason I know this specifically is you were one of the people that immediately was on the phone calling the teaching center to find out more about it i just remember that distinctly well so um next month five thousand kids are going to graduate from dental school and when um so my question is you know how does a kid graduate from dental school get him end up someday to be as great of a dentist as you now when you got out of dental school you were telling me you you first did um a military um was that an agd was that training was yeah, i was in a general lo- practice residency when i was in the air force and then i was accepted for dual training and i did perio pros as a dual training while i was in the air force uh those were all the the initial in- education pieces before i left the air force I was and, in the Air Force for nine years. And so if a, if a kid's listening to this podcast, he's a senior in dental school, um, would you recommend to her that maybe she should do a GPR? Do, do you, looking back, was that a good decision for you? Well, for me, it was an in- incredibly good decision. I Even being in the Air Force was an incredibly good decision because I had an opportunity to do a lot of dentistry uh, with some supervision, which was already beginning the training. and already started to feed my passion for education. It's an interesting question because my son is a dentist. Dean. And he went on to be a prosthodontist and also do his impact fellowship at uh, NYU. And I think these are some questions that we bantered back and forth because people would say, why would he need to go to specialty training rather than just work with your dad? This is what they would say to him. And he would say to you, he really didn't want to just spend his life parroting me. He wanted to be able to challenge me so that we would have a better relationship the more training that he uh, would obtain. And that couldn't be more further from the truth. It's improved his uh, feeling about what he does, but it also gave him a better appreciation for the education at the center. Because once you've been to a specialty uh, program, you can really understand a lot more about what continuing education needs to do and what are some of the shortcomings in continuing education. And so I would say anyone that wants to do any teaching, wants to work in any dental school, the more organized specialty training you receive, the better off you would be. So, uh, Dr. Coyce, these kids are coming out with... uh two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on average of student loans and a lot of them think well if i want to be a good dentist like dr coyce i gotta double down and buy a hundred and fifty thousand dollar cad cam machine a hundred and fifty thousand dollar cbct machine an eighty thousand dollar laser and with just three pieces of equipment they've doubled their debt so my question is do they need to double their debt on high price stuff to be a quality dentist like you so we we see that uh, trend absolutely occurring uh, where we we tend to get a lot more younger dentists at the teaching center than ever before now let me just back up for a minute before we jump into equipment needs 
The, the idea of the teaching center is a curriculum for practicing dentists. So it would be an opportunity for somebody to be in practice and get additional training to really become great. Now, to do that and leave practice and go to specialty training, if you think about the debt coming out of school, that is quite a, a challenge, to leave up the practice opportunity, leave opportunities uh, on the table of working uh, for uh, you, in your own business, put those years behind, that is incredibly expensive. So what we've tried to do is create a curriculum where they can receive all the training they needed to do the kind of dentistry that they want to do. And I have no doubt that they can do that. Then the part about the equipment, it's a little bit misleading if people start to think that they could just buy a product and become great. I call that product seduction. You want to be really careful. I mean, you can, you can get Andre Agassi's tennis racket, but that doesn't mean you can play tennis. So along with the technology does require training. Now what we think works better for some of the younger dentists is to leverage the technology. You don't need to own a CBC. Uh, CBCT scan to have access to it. You can outsource that in the practice. You don't have to riddle yourself in debt until you are able to really get a return on investment. Depends on your practice and your situation. What we see is most of these younger dentists have partnered with an older dentist may be ready to sell the practice in a few years. The other dentist could be a mentor to them to help them with their training. And so actually the newer generation of younger dentists are all working with uh, other dentists that have been through the center also. So the growth is pretty exciting right now. But you're absolutely correct. When dentists get saddled with debt, it's really hard uh, to not be in a survival mode and not to then make maybe poor choices which would be poor for the patient or even poor for the practice. Well, uh, uh, one decision that stresses them out a lot is a $150,000 um, CAD CAM. Um, you know, when you and I got out of school, it was an impression, with a, and we talked about a quality lab. Uh, now they think they have to buy a $150,000 CAD CAM. Do you think they need to buy a $150,000 CAD CAM? So, even posing the question that way is really interesting because you're right, you know, in, in our day, uh, at the end of the year when you bought new equipment, you were buying mouth mirrors and <laughs> explorers, and now you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's no question in my mind the future is in digital dentistry, is in CAD CAM technology, is in many of the emerging technologies of this time, which in the future I think will help dentists become more efficient, be able to run a practice and even have competitive fees. The problem is as dentists get squeezed with debt service, it then what happens on the outside is almost a race to the bottom very hard to differentiate the practice if you just look like a me too practice and some dentists think the technology it would be what would be required to differentiate themselves from the practice across the street when in fact I think the training will emerge as being the best differentiator if dentists really learn to provide risk analysis for patients understand what teeth belong in the face and then understand how they really should fit together with occlusion, that will sustain them for the rest of their life. Then, all the other technology, albeit implants, milling technology, all the machinery that you're talking about, is mostly tooth replacement options, but they're all based on the main theme. Where do you place them? Why do you do this? Survival probability, really understanding the meaning of what we're doing. So, Dr. Goyce, a lot of these young kids don't realize until they're, you know, I'm 52, they, they don't realize at 25 that they walk in there and they see a new patient and they're pointing to a chipped tooth and they immediately go into making a crown or whatever. And then guys like you, you walk into a room and you, you don't do one tooth dentistry. You don't do quadrant. You, you see the whole big picture. How can this young kid so let me just, migrate let from, me just interject yeah. one second. Uh, in reality, what you're speaking about is correct. In fact, my practice, I mostly treat dentists. But really what I think the future is, 
is to do the one tooth dentistry knowing what's going on in the rest of the mouth so that it's not that you've ignored it it's that actually you've evaluated it and have learned to be able to manage the situation based on a very comprehensive evaluation now the problem with that is for younger dentists especially or any dentist there is a certain amount of time it takes to provide that evaluation and dentists find a lot of difficulty in getting compensated for that so where the tension becomes it's kind of like an art commerce tension where we already realize what we really want to be doing but to find a way to monetize that and make a living at it to now pay for all the debt service that you're talking about becomes really challenging and really difficult and so we're actually working harder to find ways to have the technology be used in a more global way a more expanded way for instance to buy scanning technology just to do crown and bridge or just to be able to do planning for implants is one thing. But if you could use scanning technology to evaluate every patient that comes in as a permanent record, what they look like, be able to compare the scans over time, you'd be able to actually provide a very interesting entry point for patients at a very reasonable fee which could then be used in so many different ways as these patients age, change, because our goal is to keep people healthy. And so what dentists have adapted or adopted for the most part is a reparative model rather than a wellness model. And for me, I think the real future in medicine and healthcare is keeping people healthy, and that's really going to require the training and the technology to be able to do that effectively. So are you optically scanning all new patients today? We're starting to do that right now. We are working very hard to have that become a seamless integration so that you can appreciate if now that technology is used on every patient that walks in the practice and now it has a opportunity for that to be delegatable, uh, this becomes a really interesting use of the technology which now makes <coughs> this uh, very uh, m well makes it much more u utilized in practice and now the dentist can, will find a, a, the ability to get more of a return on investment. Is there any optical scanner that you like at this point? Well I work with so many dentists that come to the teaching center and it's really hard to separate what optical scanners are associated with what business strategy you want to use to apply them, uh, what types of technology you really want to do with these, tech, with these scanners, because really what some of the concerns have been, not all the scanners have complete open architecture, so you can't be talking to a variety of different endeavors to be able to do more and more things. So it's really hard right now because the uh, communication needs with digital workflow is being restricted by the business profiles of many of these companies. So to answer your question, I don't really have a single scanner that I would absolutely recommend. What I would prefer the dentist do is prefer at, to first decide exactly what they think they want to use it for because that will help direct them more in the direction that they need to move into. As far as the technology itself, all of the technology has gotten better and it continues to get better. But let me say this because you and I can relate to this being a little bit older. At this time there is not any digital technology that is more accurate than well done conventional impressions. So where I feel dentists really need to be cognizant of these problems is to understand that technology isn't really going to make them better. It could make them more efficient. You still have to be able to understand the principles and apply the principles and use the technology as an adjunct to that, not as a replacement for and not having the training and not having the understanding. Otherwise, the technology is just a product. Correct. Um, 
So explain to someone who's never gone to the Quay Center, um, explain to them the curriculum. How, how, how does the Quay Center, and, and what is the www on that? Um, KoiCenter.com. Uh, K-O-I-S, it is. which is Greek, Center, <laughs> C-E-N-T-E-R, yes. dot com. Um, is it a, a three-part, a four-part? Explain the curriculum so of we what have, you're trying to do at the Koi uh, Center. We have nine different courses. Uh, we nine have, different courses. Yes, we have a full curriculum, plus we have adjunct courses by some of what I think are the most talented teachers also in the world. Uh, we've actually started to move to what we call track courses, which are five days. And, so a full week, Monday uh, through Friday, yep, 8 to 5? Yep, because oddly enough, dentists want to be able to come into an intense environment of training so they can dedicate themselves to the training and then leave by Friday a different dentist than when they came on Monday. And, and I truly believe that we can do that. Now, those, so you, you have nine different courses, but, but are each one of those a track? You have nine uh, different tracks? We have three different track courses. And is it, um, do you have to do the other ones first or, or attract the entry level? There are some that are prerequisites for those. Will you go over that? Because um, I'm, I'm trying to help the person who's never been there. How do, well, how do you recommend to start? What would be, what's the, the first step? How would you do the Koi Center in order? So let me answer it this way. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the center. Uh, I, I'm perfectly comfortable also, remember, trying to have this discussion helping younger dentists so that I, I will say this. The easiest way to find out the most about the center is go to the website so you don't have to hear me say a lot of things we're not going to remember anyway. <laughs> so that's the you're, first thing. I, I know you're a humble man. You're, yeah, you're old school. I know. I you're know. a humble guy. So I, I would say the website and even a phone call to, uh, to the folks at the center that are very well uh, versed at understanding what these courses can do. But to be very honest, uh, what I'm very proud of, the people that come to the center are coming mostly from word of mouth. They come from other dentists that have already achieved the outcome they, they wanted and are so excited about that they've referred their friends, which is, is the highest level of referral, just like practice, that we like. Well, in Dental Town, um, you know, where you put your pictures called your avatar, and I can't even count how many dentists' avatar picture is them standing there with you. <laughs> and that, that that is their trophy. I didn't actually know that. That's like so. having an elk deer head above your fireplace, you know, the the big moose head that you got up there. But yeah, I can I can think of so many of my friends that that's their avatar picture just there standing. Well, I'm you. very I'm I'm very grateful for that. And and by the way, I don't take that lightly. Uh, we work very hard to take care of dentists when they come because, you know, uh, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And that's not my words, that's Aristotle. But uh, the point of that- yeah, Another Greek, another yeah, famous another, Greek. Uh, yeah, I tend, to, <laughs> I tend to gravitate that way. Uh, but I think the point is, we try to also build relationships with uh, these, all the dentists that are coming. And they're part of what we call a tribe, which is uh, akin to an extended family. Uh, because to us, it is very serious that we can support each other, that the education at the center, we, I say this, what happens in Seattle is not meant to stay in Seattle. It's meant to get back into the practice. It's meant to help other people. Otherwise, it's wasted. So if we can't have education that's transformational and is only transactional, there would really be no reason to come to the center. So we're working very hard to make sure we can accomplish that. Okay, Dr. Coyce, I want to I want to go into something. Um, um a, a new patient exam. Um, I, it it might be one of the hardest things to really learn in dentistry is the simple new patient exam. Every experienced surgeon says, you know, I'd rather you have a correct diagnosis and an average surgery than the wrong diagnosis and a great surgery. Um, go over an oral exam. What, what, how is your amazing mind? What what are you looking for in a complete? Exam. So the, the idea about that is you, you realize, again, that this tension of the amount of time things take relative to the outcome generated from the time. Dentists have to become very efficient at being able to start to make the evaluation fairly quickly. Now, 
On the flip side of that, the problem when you get very good about making an evaluation quickly, the patients don't perceive the value attribution for all the, the intelligence that's been provided. In other words, you know, anybody can have a Panorex or a CBCT scan, but what, you, what really is the uh, roots of the training is what it means. It's the meaning of the data. And so what I see is many dentists really don't understand the meaning of the data. So that's the first thing. So what the training has to accomplish first is what do you want to achieve? What is the outcome of the exam? Then what we do is we back that up and begin to determine what what would be the minimum data that you would need to collect to get the outcome that you want? Because what I see too many dentists do is they just collect data that is just fluffy data. It doesn't really do anything for them. So what we do is we work the other way around, first of all, to understand why do I need this, this data. Let me give you a perfect example. We all tend to measure maximum opening uh, between the teeth when we're looking at a joint evaluation. And dentists tell me they average it three times to get a number. Well, if you really understood it, you might think about it differently. So let me explain. What you're really doing is determining do they open much too wide, where they might have joint laxity or hypermobility, that'd be a jaw that can open more than 65 millimeters, those folks are at risk for joint derangements, etc. Or do they have a restricted opening, which could be a disc problem or a muscle problem, less than 35 millimeters. So very quickly, what you're really trying to do is determine who's not in the normal range, not trying to get an exact number, because whether you're 45 or 52, it doesn't really matter. So clearly, as soon as you understand it, it makes a big difference. Now, the next part. I could take my three fingers, which are roughly about 50 millimeters from one to the other, and I can put them between your front teeth and say open, and if my fingers fit in just like that, Howard, you have normal maximum opening. But the problem is that doesn't really, in this day and age, have very good what I call show quality. If I took a special measuring device and actually measured that that was 51 millimeters, it'd be much more impressive, but it does the same thing. So the idea, there's, there's a part of this that the dentist does need to be able to have the communication skills, ha have a little bit of the, what I call the show quality, to get the patient to at least understand the value of their examination. Otherwise, most people leave that examination and they just think the dentist shoved something between their teeth or did this. They don't have an appreciation for it. So these underappreciated, undervalued protocols are not going to really help make the practice grow. The patient has to get out of your chair and say, my goodness, I've never been evaluated like that in my life. Now, you'll be surprised. Most dentists already uh, think that that requires a lot of time. Well, the first appointment in most practices is a conveniently broken appointment because the patient hasn't established a loyalty relationship with that practice. So in my practice, you're not going to get an hour and a half appointment as an initial appointment. You may spend an hour and a half in the practice, but you're not going to see the dentist for an hour and a half. There's some entry point with our dental assistant, our new patient coordinator. There is a time for me to do the evaluation. I get 30 minutes, no more than that. And even that, by, by most standards, is, is fairly long. But it's a, an opportunity to do everything that was necessary to build the future in your practice. And by the way, I have more people referred to me from people I've never really treated in my practice because they're impressed with how they're taken care of. Where most dentists are trying to get referrals from the big cases or the aesthetic cases, and, and it's true, it does that, but there's a whole lot more people 
that are coming through hygiene all the time that have much more potential to be ambassadors for your practice. And my staff is trained to be an ambassador to the practice and an advocate to the patient. And the patients can feel that because we're there for them. And if the practice is not coming across in that way, you don't have the loyalty relationships. You don't have the, the practice that you're trying to build based on you. So my preference would be to, to build your practice based on your brain, your intellectual property, and the skill sets will come. Because if dentists are trying to build a practice based on commodities, after a while we all look the same. You know, when people come in, we all have a big chair and we have some kind, either a, a laser or radiograph system, to mo and we have a handpiece. So to most people, we still look the same. And so people have to be very careful. You might have the coolest new technology, but no matter how cool you are, that technology will be out obsolete sooner or later. So you need to be really careful that you sustain the growth, not just based on equipment that you have, but based on your philosophy, based on uh, how people now relate to you in terms of they know that you're there to take care of them and they trust you. That is a whole different way of building a practice than just buying technology. So Dr. Hoys, you're obviously one of the fathers of modern dentistry in America. I wouldn't go that far. No, no, you absolutely, you absolutely it's are. It's very gracious. So I want to ask you, um, you, you, you're in this country, you've, you've seen it. When, you know, 25 years ago, we saw Orthodontic Centers of America get to the New York Stock Exchange with a billion dollar capitalization and a dozen on NASDAQ, then they all imploded and died. And then there was nothing for 10 years. Now chains are back. Heartland has um, 500 offices and 1,000 dentists. Um, I think they even have more. 600 yeah. offices and 1,000 dentists. Um, do you, how, how is, what, what do you think of, uh, some people think that dentistry is not as good as it was 50 years ago. What, what do you think of the profession of dentistry today? What do you think of, what, opine on corporate dentistry? Is this a good thing, a bad thing? Okay, um, you know, let me talk, answer talk, it. Talk about that a little bit. Let me bit. answer it a couple different ways. There's nothing the same that it used to be. Right. right. And even mentality of people has changed dramatically. For instance, uh, we know we live in a society where we're all on the smartphones and uh, I see it all in the audience, everybody's multitasking and by the way, you can't do more than two things at one time because the brain only has two halves. So the data is pretty clear that the more multitasking you're doing, you can't be really thorough about it. So, you know, we live in a world where the microwave is too slow, <laughs> right? Everybody wants something instant. I mean, when the phone, when you make a phone call <clears throat> and you're watching the time, if it gets around 10 seconds, I'm already getting antsy because that should have connected by now. Let's be realistic. That thing went to space and back. <laughs> so we have to be a bit more patient sometimes. So my point, though, is the mentality of people is different. Uh, people, uh, I feel, are uh, maybe not as understanding all the time as they used to be. Uh, this is why being able to sit and talk to people to get them to understand uh, informed consent, understanding more about these procedures. And by the way, informed consent is about explaining to people what can go wrong when you do a procedure correctly, which is very different than what most people think. For instance, if a patient today has post-op sensitivity, they're thinking, what did you do wrong? Not that that could be a, a usual sequela of whatever the procedure was. So uh, coming back to this, I think dentistry is actually more exciting than ever before. The access to technology. The access to technology, by the way, is changing the skills needed actually to be great. Because the way I speak about that is if you don't know how to buy it, if you don't know how to park a car, you can buy a car that parks itself. So where the technology really has an edge is to be able to provide opportunities to replace some of the skills that may be unnecessary. I mean, take a camera. You can pretty much take a picture from space <laughs> and be able to uh, do things with that. 
So where I think there's a huge opportunity here is to learn to use the technology to leverage the skills that maybe you don't really have, but what you still need is the intellectual property to make the right decisions. Now that technology can be an incredible asset more than things ever were before. I mean, look at the scanning technology and the ability to create surgical guides to reduce the risks in implant placement. And that's why, I mean, we're here in this symposium. So it has really opened up the opportunity to put many more procedures in many younger dentists. So at this point, I actually think the future is incredibly exciting. The downside is it's also very competitive. The business environment is so different. The, as you mentioned from the opening of the interview, the dentist being riddled in debt and, and being a bit um, almost uh, choking from the debt is not a good feeling. And you know, it wasn't that different when I started. When I started, uh, when I first bought my practice, interest rates were almost 18%. And the first year in my practice, my adjusted gross income was zero. Uh, the second year in my practice, I still made less than my hygienist. So there's a future out there, and I don't think too much replaces hard work. And, and I think those folks that are willing to put in the work and really do it will become great. I agree. Um, so many of these dental students whine about their $250,000 student loans, and you go through their spending a junior senior year. I mean, every spring break, they went to Cabo for $5,000. They went on a, a cruise every summer. They drove a $30,000 Honda Accord. I mean, we, I, I didn't have a car the first six years of dental school. I bought a car my senior year of dental school and walked the first five years. And when I got to school, we worked a lot of hours. A lot of these kids come out of school, $250,000 of debt, and they work Monday through Thursday, eight to five. My dude, that's not even a job. <laughs> that's not even a job. You know, Howard, that's, I hear that a lot, but the dentists that come to the center, uh, number one, they're very passionate about what, what they're doing and their future. And what I find is many of them are not like that. They actually uh, have a fairly austere lifestyle. I've had some dentists that don't have a television even, and they're paying for education. I had one dentist tell me uh, at the end of the year she had $500 extra and she used that $500 to put the deposit on the course. So it is really incredibly inspiring for me to see what many of these younger dentists are actually willing to do to, to provide more stability for their future and make a difference in this world. Okay, John, you're at the Megagen Implant Symposium. Are you yourself placing implants? We is, just, I don't place your them son anymore. Dean my son, them? my son is a fantastic dentist and a fantastic colleague to work with. So we have a wonderful, wonderful time. But he does all the surgery for me. He's a prosthodontist doing, but he'll place them. He's also an implant prosthodontist. I'm a perioprosthodontist. You're a perioprosthodontist and you do not place them? Not anymore. And your son, oh, you used to? At one time. And, and your son is a prosthodontist and he does place them. Yes. And so um, does he use, um, let, let's talk first about um, surgical guides. Does Dean always use a surgical guide or what, what are your thoughts on surgical well, guides? Well, working with my cases, uh, I know he's always has the planning technology taken care of and for the most part, the surgical guide in some way. It, it wasn't always the the, the newer types of surgical guides because we started before we had many of those available. So, uh, but I would say there, there's never an implant being placed without proper planning and without some way of figuring out the direction or how the implant is to be positioned. So John, it's, um, I, I'm, my motto is, you know, um, with Dental Town, no dentist has to practice solo again. Um, I thought the internet um, and now the smartphone solves that, the loneliness issue. So most of these people are listing this on their on iTunes on the way to work through their Bluetooth. They're all alone, and there's a C. Of, I mean, there must be 50 implant companies. Um, nine out of ten dentists do not place implants, so they're like you. Only one out of ten would place them like your son. So as far as um, restoring an implant as a prosthodontist, is an implant an implant an implant? Do you like 
restoring some systems more than others? You know, starting to move into brand choices and what's available out there is are really hard to do something meaningful in the, in the short time that we have. But let me say a few things. There is no doubt that there is more hype about some of the differences in the brands than maybe is required. In other words, I realize for, for many of these companies, it's an incredibly competitive market and it's really difficult to differentiate yourself in this market because for the most part, an implant design, the ones for today have really come a long way and many of them do so many incredible things. So I would say, just to go back, when we started initially with the Brandemark system, we had the oldest type of implant, smooth surface, flat top. I mean, we had very good success. So understanding the biology, the biology about implant management is really key because the brand that you choose is only the last drill right the last drill will dictate whatever implant you now pick up and many of these implants have become extremely competitive and have demonstrated excellent survival capability in the in the patients they all have their share of problems but I think it's really difficult for many of the dentists to make the choices Dr. Coyce, I always look at the search words that dentists are searching each month. And when it comes to implantology, a lot of search, the, the, probably the two most um, popular searches are immediate load and platform switching. Those, those, can you talk about those two words? Uh, you know, there's those two searches. The, between immediate load, platform switch, and do you cement the crowns or screw retain exactly. the crowns? I'm gonna say, I, mean, I can't believe you beat yeah. me on my own data. That was, uh, yeah, that right? yeah, okay. you see better, sir, it's, absolutely. It's, I mean, so will you talk about all those, those three things? So, you know, it, it's interesting because really what's important is understanding the, the limitations and the, the, liabil or the liabilities or the assets of any of those options. So we know, for instance, that there is uh, critical features in neck design, which platform switch is one. Well, will you explain to us the, what platform switch is uh, in case someone's out there? For the most part, moving the micro gap between the connection of the restoration to the connection of the implant slightly to the inside of the interface is one of the critical components to reduce crestal bone loss and that's the initial crestal bone loss that we used to see to what's called the reference position, which was the first thread. So a lot of the newer designs are actually capable of, if you put the implant at the crest of the bone, they're absolutely capable of maintaining the bone at that level. In fact, some implant systems may have the potential to grow the bone up to the crest, to the, uh, to the fixture level uh, platform. So there's some really interesting dynamics going on. My preference in describing this to dentists, where this gets confusing is when you look at survival probability, you don't see enough of the nuances is in terms of what your choices create. Because you can have an implant that is integrated, is surviving, but there are three, four, five uh, threads exposed which may have now a consequence down the road for periimplantitis or other liabilities in, in implant management for this patient, for the future of this patient. So we need to be really careful because, to be honest, uh, putting implant in bone that you see at the time of placement has less risks of some of the secondary factors and there's no question about that. The problem with that, it doesn't expedite the treatment, and it doesn't mean, by the way, that immediate implants are, are potentially not successful, because they absolutely are, but again, it comes down to treatment planning and case selection. If you go even to screw versus cement retained, the data actually comparing the two shows minimal to no difference in terms of maintaining marginal bone. And in fact, if anything, the cement retain 
restorations shows a slight improvement. And that seems to be counterintuitive to what the rage is out there. Nothing, nothing absolves us of responsibility. And there's no question there are liabilities and risks in cement retained restorations because a lot of these restorations fit like a tomato on a stick. And getting access to the interface is, is a problem. Not numbing patients up sometimes is a problem because the dentist may be holding back from what they know they should be doing because they're trying to keep the patient comfortable. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that we work through at the teaching center to help dentists at least make better choices. Because believe me, there isn't always an option to not have to do a custom abutment. So to say you're all this or all that is quite frankly a bit silly. Um, I would, um, the data looks like 95% of the crowns that go to a lab are just one unit at a time, only 5% are multiple. The data looks like 95 out of 100 implants are placed just one at a time. When we get into multiple implants, uh, the biggest thing everybody's hearing about on the internet or patients coming and talking about is a lot of marketing for, um, all on four. Um, do you, do you have any thoughts on that or is that well, just a brand? Is that marketing? No, hype? no, no. Is there something uh, look, to that? You know, you know what the buzzword is in the market. It's all on four and none on three. And, and you know, we've learned a lot over the years when, uh, subsequent to where we are now, we would be doing six to eight or 10 implants <laughs> in an arch. And now we know that all on four is a viable concept. The, the survival probability indicates that's the case. But remember, you're, you're leaving yourself with a very fine line between something that could become a real significant problem, meaning one implant fails and you have a significant failure. Which means none on three. Which is none on three. So you're really a bit, a bit limited on your contingency options many times. Now, the, the gamble would be the implants are so successful that that should happen infrequently. And there's truth to that. Uh, but I would prefer that we're really careful and not just pushing our treatment decisions solely based on business strategies. In the end, it will cost you a lot of money to try to back out of a disaster that you were just trying to expedite treatment in the wrong patient. So sometimes you have to go slow to move fast. And, and, and hmm. realizing that is really critical part of what we're, we have to learn. So I'm gonna follow right on that. Um, you get a patient, full denture, and they want implant retained, removable denture. What would be your just normal person, 65 year old woman, um, I, I want implant retained, full dentures. What would you do? Six on the lower, six on the upper. What what would you think? Would that depend on? Well, uh, I have cases uh, with four, and they're working beautifully. Uh, I haven't knock on. Wish there was wood around here. I haven't lost an arch uh, yet, uh, but we're really trying to be selective. Nobody's going to take a patient that is uh, an uncontrolled diabetic. Uh, people with active infection, sick people. That is not a concept for sick people. Um, the concept is based on certain levels of health and certain, certain availability of bone. And the things that really cannot be uh, underscored, I mean, really emphasized enough are really the criteria that creates the success rate. So sometimes I have to say to a patient, because they all ask for this immediate and doing it expeditiously. It's just like the microwave is too slow. And sometimes, you know, we have to explain to patients, you know, Mr. Jones, and I use the Mr. Jones analogy, we have to be really careful here because what may save you four months may create a need to pay a price for the rest of your life. And we have patients where the treatment was expedited, but now they've had several surgeries beyond that to correct other problems. And, 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 and dentists need to be very careful that they plan their implant placement 
from where the teeth go in the face, not where the available bone is, and then they come up with a design that will, will handle that. Now there are situations where you can move the restoration off what would be clearly off what would be considered axial loads and not actually create a liability for implant longevity. Because most of us have been brainwashed and the load has to always be axial. Well, that's sort of silly because we see all these tilted implants that are just as successful as vertical implants and there's no data to support that. So people tend to continue to say things from dogma, emotion, without any science behind it. So the teaching center, by the way, the tagline is advancing dentistry through science. And, and the reason is I don't want people to come to the center to learn some technique that we're doing because then we sort of get tied to it and we don't evolve because some, some teaching modalities are teaching based on their technique. And so their identity is based on how they did it, not the science. Because as the science changes, maybe your technique needs to change. Well, we are out of time. I cannot believe that you gave me an hour of your time, and this is one of the uh, this greatest actually, highlights. This of is my... actually too bad. I'm I'm really starting to get into this right now, Howard. <laughs> so um, it's and, and, uh, really and you're, fun. You're about to go on stage. What are you going to talk about today at the Mega Jones? Uh, actually, Symposium? my lecture is called Hitman versus Healer, and what it's about is I feel that uh, as a dentist uh, in my early part of my career. I would be always facing patients and telling them what's wrong and trying to explain to them what I think was going to happen to them. And for the most part, it, was, it wasn't real, uh, really based on science. It was based on what people thought would happen. And I didn't really train for that. I trained to be a healer. And so here's the difference. If you go to your cardiologist today you go there because there's something wrong in the blood work that is, is, is telling you you have a problem. So where's the hitman there? The hitman is in the blood work. And now the cardiologist is there to help you re fix the problem, the healer. I felt that wasn't the way my practice was. I didn't feel like the healer. I always felt like the hitman. And the joy started to go away. As soon as I became a healer, the joy came back to dentistry. Wow, that's beautiful and profound. I can't wait to uh, hear it. Um, thank you so much again, Doc. Thanks, Howard. And thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it.